be monitored by the government everywhere they go. So this is this happened to many of West Papua activists. You know, that's it's almost 30 years or more than 30 years I've been in COVID. I witnessed, even though now like I'm in, in exile, uh, I still uh, uh, hear more West Papua activists uh, arrested. So this is this is something that I'm glad that um, we are now we learn about this this uh, struggle together with the international community. And I yeah I do hope that uh, from this seminar, it's not just my story, but other story like yeah, uh, Belinda story will inspire others to learn. So uh, what I'm trying to say this time is what I mean in the late President Suharto uh, till President SBY, Susilo Bamba Yuno Yono. That's a specific like human rights abuses. Human rights is you know, violations committed by the Indonesian government is still going on. Mm. And so nothing changes West Papua when we're talking about the uh, democracy, when we're talking about the, the right of the people have a freedom of assembly or mm. to have a freedom of speech that uh, United Nations, they stand for. That's a, the, 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 the UN charter. The, 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 the explain that for a while. But for us as West Papua, we don't have uh, our rights. So Indonesian government treating West Papuan people is different different with the other uh, Indonesian citizen in the in the constitution. So uh, this is something that yeah, as a one who was targeted by Indonesian government to be killed, yeah, I had to yeah, escape. The only way is to save my life so I can continue with my yeah activism work or political activism work to raise awareness about what's going on in West Papua because I, I do believe about uh, this uh, cause that when West Papua gets independence and then we don't, we don't uh, face <laughs> any more uh, human rights of blessing. <laughs> uh, 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 but if still uh, living under Indonesian government, ruled by Indonesian government, Tomorrow morning or next week, we get more. Uh, yeah, we can hear more people get arrested and then killed. And like we can imagine in the last well, few years. So this is something that uh, I, I, yeah, continue to to raise this uh, uh, voice because. I, I raised my concern as well when I, I, I did a lobbying to the Pacific Island Forum in 2002. When I say in one of the, uh, my, uh, or our um, media conference, I say to the Pacific Island Forum, during the time the Pacific Island Forum uh, uh, in, in Fiji in 2002, I, uh, I say that if, the international community or Pacific country you still uh, giving a support to the Indonesian government. That's need to give a green light to Indonesian government to continue to kill West Papua. Mm. It was happening in 2002. And then after I returned from the Fiji to West Papua, I got arrested for the second time. And yeah, I had no choice. After I released from the prison, I had to escape from West Papua. So this is something that uh, I would like to say uh, this time. And yeah, I would like to yeah, yeah, say more. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Jason, for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, Di. Um, it, it's wonderful to have you here on this on this webinar, and and you, there'll be more opportunities to share more about that story. Let, let's continue um, with the introductions. I'll go to you next, uh, Adolf. Can you just say a little bit about yourself um, and your background, and and you know how, why you became an activist? Thank you. Um, 
Thank, thank you, Kaka Jason. I um, appreciate for the um, lovely afternoons that we're all meeting through the webinar. We're all learning from the hard way. This is as a reason, and we have to break it up. All this being setting up by the corporation, so we all know that. Um, look, a little bit of my story. I was um, a little child and studying in the village back home in West Papua, and to getting the high education, we, we see the, uh, the difference, uh, uh, discriminations between the indigenous and non-indigenous kids. Um, the world treated it differently from um, the non-indigenous, and that's where I see the uh, discrimination and, and, and injustice um, start building up. And I was a little child, and I I've felt, felt that. Um, democracy is not there uh, for very much the whole um, West Papuan. And that's where building up my momentum to um, criticize. And I see where, if it's there's no justice there and where are we going to comply and then where are we going to put the, our uh, criticize against um, the authority. So that's where I find the strong ability uh, physically as an activist start from my childhood. And, and the same things not happen only myself, but it's among the uh, uh, generation, new generation in, in, in my group age and, and pass it on to the young generation until now. And there are a lot of a uh, group movement back in West Papua has been identified that these people should be should be have a right to be listened, and the government we we know the government's authority is always denying, and yes, yeah, so I become uh, active very much to strongly uh, talking to criticize um, things that not not um, regular to. Uh, protect the community and especially the people right and move on from the um, second, uh, secondary school to high school and even go to university and apply student activists it's ordinary job that's ordinary job with no paid job but you have to continue to do that and compared to some of the people that are already working in corporation then they continue they want to make a commitment that thought that could be in other times they can work as an activist, but it's a long struggle and it's not working if it's only people want to work, do two things in once. So I believe yeah, as a student activist, it's ordinary work for us and it's a job, big job that we don't get paid from the uh, people, we don't get paid from the local authority, but that's, we believe, um, long struggle, we have to continue going forward. And I'm sure we have plenty of time to dig in more information to talk about it tonight. And I'm, yeah, I'm ready. Let's break it out. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful, indeed. Thank you, Nai. I, I really, really glad you can join us. So uh, for those who are, uh, who've joined in, tuned into the webinar or who are watching uh, live on YouTube or who will, you know, watch at some later date. We're, we're joined here by uh, Herman Wangai and Adolf Mora, who were two of the 43 who fled West Papua in a traditional canoe and really sparked off uh, the Lombok Treaty. And perhaps I should name the Lombok Treaty after you and the other, uh, uh, other 41. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get to that very soon. But but for now, let's go to, to you, Blinda. Can you just say a little bit about yourself, who you are and, and how you came to be interested in, in West Papua? Sure. And thank you for having me and um, Herman and Adolf. It's really great to, to meet you. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing more of your story. Um, as told by you, obviously, I've, I've heard it um, and read about it. Um, well, I, my background is um, a journalist, a storyteller and a researcher. And I uh, came to West Papua through Jakarta. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I moved to Jakarta 
to work as a journalist um, and actually a sub editor uh, for the English language newspapers. And in my spare time, whenever I had time off, I would try and travel all over Indonesia. I really went everywhere, nearly everywhere during the time I was there. And the last place that I traveled to was Papua. And I guess I've always been a person that is interested in stories that aren't told or aren't allowed to be told. I think it's because my family is Spanish and they left Spain uh, during the dictatorship, during the Franco dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And I came to learn that my family learned about stories that weren't told when they got to Australia, because in Spain, they, they weren't allowed to be told. It was a dictatorship. So stories that cannot be told have always fascinated me. And it was really shocking to me or confusing as a 22 year old to go to Papua and to discover a place that was treated as though it was different from the rest of Indonesia. And to meet many Papuans who asked me to learn about their stories and were trying to tell me and asking me to tell my people about their stories. Um, and I held that with me for a long time and I always thought that I would like to explore it in more depth. Um, so I had the opportunity to do a PhD and I decided that I really wanted to learn, you know, it's as, as we all know, it's incredibly difficult to access Papua as a researcher or a journalist for a long period of time. But I had a sense of really wanting to know what it was like for Papuans who left Papua and came to Jakarta, came to Java, and what their experience would be like when they came to the capital, to the heart of the political and economic, you know, the, the center of Indonesia um, as it's perceived politically. So my research was spent, you know, hanging out with Papuans in Java. And this was in 2016. So it was just really a couple of years before what ended up happening last year, the Papua uprising. And when it did, it fascinated me because the media kind of acted as though this had come out mm. of nowhere, <laughs> that it was mm. this thing erupting in Java that was a surprise. But based on my research, it just felt like something that, um, had been bubbling there for a long time. Um, so that's the short version. <laughs> Thank you, Belinda. It's, uh, it's terrific to have you here. And we'll, you know, we'll hear more about you very, um, about you and your research very, very soon. So for those of you who don't know, we're, we're talking about the Lombok Treaty and that really came about because of the arrival of uh, a canoe carrying 40, traditional West Papuan canoe carrying 43 West Papuans. So as a way of introducing that, I thought we'd go and look at one of the news clips from the day. So I've got a two and a half minute news clip. Um, and you'll see these guys, although they'll have uh, blankets or, or shirts or something over their head. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll watch that. And then I'd, I'd actually like to, we'll go back to you, Herman and Adolf, for you to say a little bit more about, you know, what that, that journey on the canoe was like. You said a little bit about why you, you had to leave. Um, basically to save your life and your activism and that all West Papuans are in the same situation and both of you are playing leadership roles. But it'd be interesting to hear some of your story about that canoe journey. And then I think that will lead into the whole question of what happened next, which is all about the Lombok Treaty. But for now, let's go to this news clip. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully uh, it will work. Uh, and okay. Let's see. Ah, technology, it's a joy, isn't it?
not exactly sure why that's not working. Let me just try. Nope. That is not working. How much fun. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll put uh, in the in the chat and also on our Facebook page, we'll put the link to um, the news clip just so you can watch it. I'm actually, I was going to show ABC uh, footage from, I think it's 7.55, so seven minutes, 55 seconds through to about 10 minute, uh, the 10 minute mark. So it was a short, uh, just over two minutes. So I just, mm -hmm encourage you to have a look at that on I don't know what happened there um, so yes we'll, we'll post post those links most definitely but let let's hear uh, you know basically that news clip it, it talks about it shows footage footage of you the canoe arriving in Cape York uh, near Weeper beautiful canoe that I believe you and uh, you helped make mm. Herman and then spent six weeks uh, sailing around West Papua collecting activists and then you spent you know time lost at sea before arriving on, on Weeper so it shows shows the canoe it shows Weeper it shows you um, being taken to a, an Air Force detention center and then there's commentary from the Australian government about how you will be processed in accordance uh, with with the law um, and the the Convention on Refugees, but let's let's go to you, uh, Herman. Do you want to start and just tell us a little bit about what that journey was like? Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, this uh, Ravina reminds me back to uh, two thousand six, and when you're talking about the yeah our journey uh, using uh, our Melanesian uh, traditional canoe, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, until uh, today, still, uh, I do believe about that journey was, uh, our journey was an uh, op optimistic uh, journey. Nah, that was uh, our, yeah, faith, the journey of uh, our faith as well. So that's why uh, when we yeah, begin our journey, it's, uh, it's came from a, uh, Ambai Island. So this is uh, for first time I say to international community that my journey began from my island, Ambai, in Japan Island. That's the journey where I come from, my family come from. As a, one of the West Papuan political family that's Indonesian government, know that. That's why they killed Dr. Tom Wangai when he was in in, in prison for 20 years. So when I was prison for second time, I thought that, yeah, I had to escape after release from prison. So that's why I organized uh, the journey secretly. Just only a few friends knew that uh, journey. And yeah, before our journey yeah, began, yeah, I did a lot of mapping on the Indonesian military bases in different cities in around West Papua. So I, I did travel in different cities around uh, West Papua before I took my friends, before I took my journey from Ambaya Island. So I, I traveled to different cities to oh yeah, do a mapping on the Indonesian military bases. And, and I, 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 I yeah, I did uh, some uh, scratch, and that's why when I started the journey, uh, easy for me to help me to navigate the 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 canoe. But it was difficult because you know, as a, as a coordinator and also as a, one of the West Papuan leader, to 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 think about the safety is more important. Safe, safety of my 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 friends, safety of the family members. So that's why we I encourage my friend to keep circuit. So we communicate to each other, just use the code language. So I create the some code language that 
just only couple of friends that I believe that okay, you you can you use this uh, uh, code language so we could communicate when we were in this point or in this point so easy to help us. So because yeah, you know, uh, West Papua, uh, uh, yeah, our place uh, everywhere is uh, dominated by uh, Indonesian military. That's right. Uh, according to my my research, as well according to what uh, I I mapping, uh, I was I mean, I met the all this uh, military base in West Papua. So yeah, I I had uh, think to about it logistic as well. You know, logistic is is very important because it's like long journey. I took it six weeks uh, from the north side of uh, West Papua. Uh, from uh, Yapeng Island to Manokwari, Sorong, and then yeah, come to the uh, Marake. So yeah, we have a lot of story behind that uh, journey. Uh, we lost, for example, we lost in the middle of the night, in the middle of the yeah, ocean, when we come from the Sorong to Merauke, we face a lot of uh, yeah, difficult situations. Sometimes uh, our friends in West Papua, they tell Herman, uh, you, well, we die <laughs> because the the ocean uh, in the north side is different with the south side in the from the Sorong to Morocco because that's a lot of a uh, um, boat uh, 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 capsided and many people uh, passengers boat uh, uh, die in the middle of the uh, ocean. So they say, hey, man, you you took the small small uh, uh, boat and then <laughs> that's not you risk uh, your your friends and your life. You you might be dying in the middle of the ocean. But I yeah. I just yeah say uh, quietly in my yeah my uh, uh, belief that if I read the Bible, I read about the story of Jesus about the he took the the, the disciple and faced the similar storm. I read the Bible, I read the story. I wanted to see that that's a similar experience that Jesus had. It happened to us. Because there's something that's one of the yeah my my testimony, uh, the spiritual uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Of faith is directing us as well. So that's why everyone we we talk to each other. We did a lot of pray, yeah. pray and fasting. Mm. That's why we start. That's why one thing I I thanks God for that because before we began the journey, we getting together in Ambai Island. We pray and fasting for almost two weeks. Almost two weeks, we pray and fasting. And then I ask everyone, and everyone has believed. And yeah, I also thank for Adolo, this was like play uh, a lot of uh, uh, yeah, responsibility because they're one of the, my key person in the journey is Adolo Mora. So I'm glad that Jason, you choose. Adolo to 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 be part of the panelists uh, and many story behind the journey about the logistic plan. Some of my family member supporting us, or some of their friends that work they are very close to me. I don't want to mention their name, but they are play their role as well to supporting us. Uh, even though uh, some of uh, West Papuan, uh, yeah, police and uh, intelligence. They also help us about this in the in the situation. So that's why it's very important that uh, how the communication that trust to each other is very important in the movement. Because if you don't trust someone, maybe the other person will cause a problem for for you. So that's why um everyone got involved with this journey. I trust them and they trust my words. After we come to the end, in the end, like almost like in, in the border, like in Marauke and in safe, yeah, safely. And then, yeah, I decided, okay, this time everyone, we are ready to have to uh, cross the open ocean to Australia. 
So, you know, it was a great risk. <laughs> but I say in to my friends, but yeah, quietly, like I say, it's better. It was like better die in the middle of the ocean than killed by Indonesia. It's better I die in the middle of the ocean that time. Mm. So I say, okay, friends, we have to leave because Indonesian uh, government or oh, with the intelligence, yeah, uh, best, they are going to find out. So we had to leave uh, in the middle of the night on 13 January. So that's a, a little story uh, behind uh, that journey because, yeah, we were targeted by the Indonesian government to be arrested, to be killed, and yeah, I do believe that uh, decided to escape is a good decision, even though like we have sacrificed our life, our life in this journey. But yeah, thanks God and thanks uh, everyone. So it's not just uh, uh, me, but because of that, we, we are working as a team. Working as a team, that's a, one key uh, word that I would like to use in this journey. That the journey come from the Ambai Allen to Sorong to Merauke, and then left Merauke to Australia because we are working as a team. So thank you, Adolo. You might be saying more. That's something that I can say for now. Thank you, Dai. Mahi kai, Dai. It's a, it's, look, it's a real privilege to be able to hear about that journey, you know, directly from you. And what an incredible, incredible journey, eh? And, uh, and amazing to hear of the support, you know, not just from people were involved in the folks on the canoe, but the, the fact that, you know, you had police refusing to cooperate with the occupation in order to ensure that you had safe passage. Um, you know, I can, I can see, you know, why, you know, some of why you're a deeply spiritual person, you know, when, because it's, it's kind of miraculous, right? Um, what you're, you're describing. So let, let's go to you, Adolf. Uh, can you just, you know, share a little bit about what it was like for you, you know, on this, on this canoe journey and, and then to cross the open sea and, uh, and arrive in Australia? It's, um, it's not something that's really happened a lot, uh, certainly in recent times. Exactly, exactly. Um, thanks, Jason, for the wonderful times. Um, yeah, I had very, very similar stories, similar to what Gaka Herman just saying. I mentioned earlier, I made by Herman's um, death. And Herman's death, it's related to, to me. It's uh, my son's um, grandfather. That's the only grandfather can uh, make the boat for us to uh, come to Australia and, and to see the privilege from the family, it's a, that the whole culture represents the whole uh, Papuan um, family. Um, that's a blessing for us to sit on the boat and come across to Australia. Uh, that was epic journey. We did it. And like Herman says, and for us, uh, the West Papuan, we believe in, in religion and religion. Um, we, we were lost and we, we try hard, we, we pray and worship. Um, believe me, of, of hardly praying and, and worship like that, but when you get lost in five days, I did it almost 24 hours for five days. And you know, that's, that's a belief that we, we, wanna, we wanna show him um, that give us a faith. And, and I like to say that Epic journey is a protest to international as well. Um, it's not just for fun. We came across with the boat, but that's bring the whole um, journey for the a protest. That's a big, big, massive protest that we did it um, 
that was the idea. We can make phones and we have the uh, uh, banner also uh, put it on the uh, boat. Um, instead of we reading to people, we want, that was exactly right. We, when we arrived in, in Queensland, we had um, journal, uh, journalists came past with the helicopter and took the picture and things like that. And suddenly in half an hour exposed exposes into the media and that we wanted. And since then we thought um, after we arrived and we're telling the uh, Australian community and also the international community that was that could have end of the story of our protest, but still not here again. Yeah, we still talk the same things tonight. And um, how long we've been in Australia? 14 years. We thought only we arrived one week later. We will make a change. It didn't happen. It took us another 14 years, even until now. And Herman has to go to America to do the more campaign. And we all spread out to do more campaigns here. And um, yes, I'm I'm glad that we we did that. We choose we choose hard way to come across to Australia. We choose to put our life on the line for the whole West Papua one as well. And that's a protest. And look, we're still talking the same things and we haven't found a solution. So I very, very strongly, I just don't wanna end this um, talking tonight, but I wanna continue to work with, with, with everyone. And um, I, I can't wait to dig in more information tonight to, to having this long conversation. And, and yeah, let's bring it on. So it was quite, quite um, epic. And we end up in Queensland with the boat and the Air Force came across and took us off to a little uh, town in, in Waipa. And straight away we off to Christmas Islands uh, the center and it's just right below uh, Jakarta. So again, that's a fear. That's a fear that still um, in our heart that we've been taken away from the Australian land and it's just a site kind of uh, Jakarta. So that could be could be another uh, uh, tactic that Australia and Indonesia could make out of that and. I'm sure since we get it, uh, we've been granted um, temporary protection visa while we stay in the center and we uh, decide to come out, live publicly in Melbourne. And guess what? One year later, Indonesia decided to do the number 20. That's stopping us. And we don't want to, we don't want to stop in there. We, we, we want to continue. So I'm sure um, that's just something short uh, um, shared tonight, but look, I can't wait to dig in more information out on the panel. Oh, yes. Thanks, Wonderful. back to you, Jason. Thanks, thanks, Adam. That's, that's great. So, so the timeline is you folks arrive uh, on, on this canoe, then if when you watch the the news reports uh, on that link and they're all they're all being compiled and they're up there on the on the internet, you'll see that a few days later uh, there was a shooting, another shooting, a uh, fatal shooting in West Papua of actually relative uh, of one of the members uh, of you know that came across on the boat. Then before your visa visas were even processed. They're actually processed remarkably quickly in comparison with a lot of other, um, you know, people seeking asylum. But even, bef you know, before the week's out, right after this shooting's taken place, you see the Indonesian government send a delegation over to Australia and the Lombok, Lombok Treaty starts to get talked about. Uh, so, I mean, you guys kicked off a, a political firestorm, really, um, that, you know, continues to create turbulence in, in the relationship. So, Belinda, this might be a good, a good segue, um, you know, to, to, go, to go to you. Like, in your view, you know, what, can you say a little bit of, first of all, can you say a little bit about what the Lombok Treaty is 
and how the how it came about and how the Indonesian and Australian governments both view it. You know, do they do they view it the same way? Do they have different perspectives on it? Um, yeah, just to kind of fill in the picture a little bit more after these guys arrived. Thank you. And we'll just need to unmute you. Hopefully you can do that yourself. Sorry, I put myself on mute. I'm a heavy breather. So <laughs> didn't want to get in the way. Um, so, yeah, I was saying, I guess there's the short history and, and the long history of the Lombok Treaty. And the short history is that Hermann Adolf and many others arrived in January in 2006. And by November, we had the Lombok Treaty. So there's no... I don't think that's a coincidence. Some say that there'd already been some, talk, you know, that SBA had already started talking about the idea of a treaty the year before, but that absolutely um, fast-tracked it, I think. Um, so the Lombok Treaty is a security pact and a, an agreement between Indonesia and Australia to, to work together. Um, and it's very vague. I think that has been the criticism across the board from all sides is that it's a document that doesn't actually say too much. It doesn't have much detail in it. Um, there's not much substance there, except for clause uh, 2.3, I believe. And I actually looked it up so that I can, uh, I don't know it by heart, but clause 2.3 says that <clears throat> consistent with their respective domestic laws and international obligations, both parties essentially won't do anything that supports or participates in activities that is somewhat of a threat to the stability, sovereignty and territorial integrity of the other party, which is, you know, essentially saying, don't say anything that gets in, in the way of our business, you know, like just back away. Part of this agreement is we'll coordinate on certain security um, protocols and investigations and so on, but don't mess with our business um, and this was Im immediately criticized to say like this is about Papua um, I, many observers pointed out at the time that's what it is but I think you know Jason you asked what how the Indonesia and Australian governments viewed uh, the Lombok Treaty I think we have to think about um, their take on the treaty and maybe the relationship and maybe Australia's relationship maybe with Papua from a longer historical lens, which is to say that we had a treaty earlier. There was one made in 1995 between Paul Keating, the then Australian Prime Minister and Suharto. And this was Paul Keating actually coming in and saying after years of Australia being incredibly suspicious of Indonesia, of seeing Indonesia as a threat, this treaty was seen as a, a remaking of the relationship of saying, okay, you're not a threat to us, we will work against threats together. But four years later, Australia intervened into East Timor. The, the treaty was ripped up. So from the Indonesian perspective, their take is that I guess you know I've seen I've seen one Indonesian commentator write we don't want any deja vu here you know you we had a treaty and you ripped it up it lasted four years so what does this treaty mean and what can we put in it to say that um, you'll this time stick to what you agreed on and I think that another point that should be made is that when the treaty was that earlier security pact was ripped up in 1999 and in 2006 when the refugees when Herman Adolf and other refugees were granted their refugee status Australia was led by a conservative government so this isn't you know the Greens who openly support West Papua this is the most conservative party in Australia that twice has reneged on what Indonesia saw as an agreement for, you know, it from their perspective to support West Papua. So the suspicion is that, and and what has you know actually happened in reality is that a conservative government who's most interested in you know the trade relationship with Indonesia is capable of doing it. So why couldn't it happen again? Um, 
So I think that's where the suspicion comes from. And from Australia's point of view, I, I don't think it's an accident that, that this treaty is so vague. I think both sides, from the time it was signed, um, you, if you read about what you know, the Indonesian foreign ministry and the Australian foreign ministry, ministry was saying about the treaty, the day that it was signed, they were saying completely different things about what it meant. Um, and so the vagueness has allowed this gray area to operate where, where if things aren't completely defined and maybe both parties like it that way, at least I think the Australians do because it's kind of the elephant in the room, you know, they just don't want to talk about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, would you like me to follow up on that, Jason? Well, I think I think that's great for now. I could we, go we on for ages. Uh, <laughs> into that. Yeah, I know, I know, right? But actually, it's a really nice segue. So, you know, you've you've got the Lombok Treaty in two thousand and six. You know, and as you point out, Keating, you know, the Labor. So that was a, cons um, you know, it was actually uh, Alexander Downer, right, who who signed it. Yeah, in two thousand and six. Yeah. Yeah. At at the time. So the uh, conservative government, then you go back and you have a Labor government actually, you know, to 95 signing this agreement, then ripping it up. A conservative but, I mean, this, government ripped it up. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. The Howard government yeah. then ripped, ripped it up. Yeah. Um, and so it's quite, you know, interesting. So you have this situation where the Indonesian government thinks, well, how can we trust? uh australia when it comes to you know question fundamental questions of self-determination and human rights I, I think this might be a good point to go to you uh di herman you know because actually if we go back even further you know before 95 we go back to 1947 uh, and the canberra agreement you know that's that's a very different agreement again can you just say a little bit about what the Canberra Agreement is and, and what the Australian government was, you know, in, involved with as a part of that and how that relates to, to West Papua and the whole question of self-determination? And you'll just have to uh, click unmute. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Dai Jason. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, after we talk about the Lombok Treaty, but yeah, we also uh, learn from the, uh, our historical concept, uh, context uh, related to the role of the Australian government, but also other country that has uh, yeah, yeah, uh, played an important role in the Pacific uh, during the yeah, well, or two in 1940. So that's one of uh, agreement yeah, we yeah, known as call uh, Canberra Agreement, uh, the, the the charter of uh, the South Pacific uh, Commission was uh, yeah, established on uh, yeah, 6 uh, February in 1947. So that was uh, initiated by uh, a uh, six country, uh, namely uh, America, uh, the Britain, uh, Britain and um, France, um, uh, yeah, the Netherlands, um, Australia, and uh, New Zealand. So, one of the fundamental uh, yeah, things of the uh, Canberra Agreement was to prepare. Uh, the yeah to prepare your countries uh, in the Pacific region uh, like uh, yeah, Micronesia, Polynesia, and Melanesia for the independence, including West Papua. So during that time, uh, uh, the Dutch was uh, yeah uh, represented the West Papua uh, in that uh, agreement. So what uh, uh, we learn or uh, what has been a uh, experience uh, by our brothers and sisters uh, in other yeah, yeah, Pacific region uh, 
they 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 gain their independence. Uh, follow the agreement. So that's uh, like uh, uh, Fiji, they gained their independence in 1970. And Solomon Islands in 1975. And uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, 1975. And uh, Vanuatu in 1980. And New Caledonia and West Papua. So like we are part, yeah, we're supposed to be independent and that's something that the Dutch government uh, promised for, for us. But yeah, what we learned uh, in other Melanesian country, the gain the independence of West Papua, it didn't happen. So there's something that uh, uh, we learned that uh, the Dutch, the Netherlands government didn't fulfill its uh, promise to West Papua. On the other hand, uh, yeah, organize, organize the another uh, agreement. So it wasn't only a country agreement, but they 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 or they, 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 they well, initiated to organize the uh, Rome agreement. Mm. So just like another agreement that's uh, yeah cause uh, 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 for West Papua, and West Papua be part of Indonesia and since then in 1960. Yeah, three. So when we're talking about the the content of the Canberra uh, uh, agreement, it's very similar with the Rome agreement to prepare the uh, the country to be independent. So Indonesia is was given mandate. Also, the another hand, according to the Rome agreement, uh, to prepare the West Papua to be independent in the future. Uh, after twenty five years, that's why Dr. Tom argue about that. Uh, in terms of the, we're talking about the uh, the pepera or the eco free choice in 1969, because according to the couple of uh, international treaties, uh, they made uh, this uh, country that uh, I already mentioned, that's like, uh, the role of the US government, the role of uh, 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 Netherlands, and then the role of the Australian government and other countries. They should help other countries like. They, they, they give the independence. But for West Papua, they forget us. So there's something that's, uh, when we're talking about the treaty, it's, it's, it's uh, something that yeah, I do believe about the, the role of the Australian government in the Pacific region is very important. So that's why uh, when we're talking the Lombok Treaty, yeah, don't forget that uh, West Papua is a, is a part of the Pacific uh, region issue that Australian government need to be, yeah, yeah, yeah part of this and help the Indonesian government to prepare West Papua to get independence uh, very soon. It's not to, to, I mean, waiting for another 50 years, you know, 25 years, but we have to uh, challenge the Australian government to play their role to help the West Papua and help uh, Indonesian government to, 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 to have our country. Uh, it's like other country in Melanesia, they already got the independence. So this party, that's why West Papua, we've been uh, fighting for, for so long, almost 57 years, they had, they're having a, yeah, many human rights a violation committed by Indonesian government uh, to them. So I think that's a, a, a few things that I would like to highlight my life uh, related to the uh, treaties that uh, the, yeah, established in the past. Thank you, Dai, Herman. Um, Adolf. Let, let, let's go to you. I mean, what, what's your, as a West Papuan community leader living in Australia, what, what's your view of the Lombok Treaty? Um, <coughs> thanks, Kaka Jason. Look, we're well, living in, in Australia. Uh, democratically, we can still do our campaign and things like that across the whole world. Um, again, go back to Lombok Treaty has minimized our movement has reduced a lot our voice to be here and it shut it down um, very much the West Papuan uh, voice to be here because look after the 23 arrived with the boat as a as a uh, protest and just in one year later uh, Indonesian decide to uh, bring up the Lombok Treaty and that's just disgusting. It's a disgusting system. It's ridiculous that they brought it into um, 
to minimize the risk of one. And also we should, by looking back to as well, so that should be the mother land of the whole Pacific nation. And West Papua should be under, um, under review to seeing that. And during the Lombok Treaty, uh, West Papua employees, uh, we don't have much representative in there to sitting in, um, as a delegation. Um, to see what whether the Lombok Treaty will be a benefit for the West Papua or not, and um, as a leader and community uh, member and community living uh, exile in, in in Australia in Melbourne, um, it's really minimize our movement. But also, that's that's a strong challenge for us to be honest with me as a, um, a political and uh, activist. It's a big challenge for me to to see. Uh, um, far for for us to challenge this level of uh, to us. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of we've, we've losing we've losing our voice that need to be here out there, and especially the global treaty has uh, stopping a lot of media and things like that, journalists and and. Out, yeah, out to West Papua, and especially is uh, the Lombok Treaty has denied um, deny any information or news that we we try to expose publicly. And with me, Lombok Treaty, it's just it's not not fair that we see uh, Indonesia has uh, brought out, and there is no compromise, and there is no compromise. And we we believe that we should we should have the um, independence of uh, since the Dutch left and the Indonesian is supposed to uh, helping us to build a nation for over a period for twenty years later since the Dutch left and don't forget Indonesian do learning a lot from the Dutch uh, colony Dutch been in, been occupied in Indonesia for. 350 years, and that's a long time enough for Indonesia to see they were under um, pressure. And this is kind of like um, modern colonization that Indonesia do to us. Because again, in Australia, the indigenous have the same things. Indigenous want to treat, uh, want to have a treaty in their own land. That's what we're supposed to have in West Papua, not the Indonesian do the treaty against West Papua. Um, don't forget, Indonesia is very smart uh, in, in doing the um, uh, planning and things like that. Um, during the treaty, bef before the Lombok Treaty, they had some um, giving us a choice to having the uh, special autonomy. Um, yeah, special autonomy in West Papua, and during the special autonomy, this is a plan that they do that, giving us happiness, giving us with billions and billions um, um, money going to West Papua, and it's all been taken by the corporations and being taken by the um, high chief uh, specialist in government sector. And that really spoiled the West Papua, but also uh, to see again in Lombok Treaty, they had a lot of planning against us. I see this is a big challenge uh, for us, and it doesn't stop us to, uh, to see it. And it's make us more brave to come out uh, publicly, yeah, to, to challenge this very, um, very much in a political way. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Adolf. So, you know, on the one hand, you're you're saying that um, you know that's not stopping you campaign. You can still, still, still campaign. But on the other hand, you feel like it's uh, it's been it's made it a bit difficult to a bit harder to to raise your voice. And exactly. Look, so, you know, to, to both yourself, uh, Adolf, as a West Papuan community leader, and also to you, uh, Di Herman, as, you know, as a West Papuan diplomat, 
have you ever got any feedback from politicians, particularly Australian politicians, when you've talked to them about the, the Lombok Treaty or you're, you've spoken about, you know, West Papua, your uh, West Papuan's desire for self-determination? Like what, what have Australian politicians said to you about the Lombok Treaty? Let's go to you first, uh, Herman. Yeah, when yeah, I just want to add as as well about the the people of uh, West Papua. Uh, uh, you hear my my voice? Hello. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, the the people of uh, West Papua, we yeah have also experienced the uh, the. Yeah, the Indonesian uh, government uh, regulation uh, number 77 uh, in 2007, that's a limited uh, with us, uh, uh, West Papua, to yeah, express our yeah, cultural symbol. So that's like another another government regulation limit uh, us. So it's not just, uh, um, it wasn't just the only uh, Lombok Treaty they created, but in the uh, same year, they, 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 they produced the, another government regulation in West Papua. Uh, what uh, we call a uh, government uh, Indonesian government regulation number 77 in 2007. So that's why something that uh, I yeah, strongly uh, yeah, argue to yeah, every uh, government representative when I yeah, yeah, met them. And yeah, yeah, since I uh, yeah, reside to US in 2012, um, yeah, I I didn't uh, meet any uh, <laughs> uh, Australian government representative to 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 yeah uh, say directly, uh, but uh, when I talk to uh, yeah yeah U.S. Congress here, I yeah highlight the issue that what's uh, happening in West Papua. We left. Uh, because of the human rights violation committed by the Indonesian government is still continuous going on till today. So, so that's why uh, yeah, very uh, yeah, tense that uh, I do hope that uh, yeah, Australian uh, government, they, 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 they yeah, have to listen to the, 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 the West Papuan people uh, voice, uh, our representative in Australia, like uh, other, other friends, uh, Mr. Jacob Rubia, or other West Papuan uh, communities there. So, so, and then we can, we can, we can continue to raise our content uh, uh, together about yeah, yeah, what's going on in West Papua uh, yeah, till uh, today, because uh, what, uh, yeah, we are really uh, concerned about the, the current situation in West Papua today that, uh, yeah, we have to argue to Australian government and U.S. government to 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 yeah, stop uh, the the yeah, uh, military assistance uh, uh, to uh, Indonesia uh, government and also uh, to stop the uh, diplomatic support uh, to uh, uh, Indonesian government in Jakarta. So this is something that uh, we would like to yeah, highlight that uh, our consent to this because the Indonesian uh, government is still uh, uh, you know, uh, creating more, more, more yeah, uh, human rights violation and they send more, a lot of uh, troops, uh, military troops in, in West Papua, everywhere in West Papua. The, the military uh, personnel is, is, is increased in West Papua. Uh, and then our our population uh, is is getting uh, I mean yeah decrease in our our own country. So this is something that uh, we would like to address to Australian government and then U.S. government, but also to uh, United Nations uh, to to yeah yeah talk to Indonesian government and uh, we have uh, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, some uh, way that uh, okay now West, uh, West Papua because we 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 are we are ready to to run our 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 country today. Mm -hmm. 
So this something says we thank to an Indonesian government. That's they 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 prepare us. Uh, many many West Papuan uh, 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 young generation, many West Papuan graduated from the different uh, university in in Indonesia. So we are capable to to round our 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 our, our country today, and also many West Papuan they graduated in different universities around the world. Many West Papuan also graduated from uh, Australia. So this is something that uh, we would like to highlight. We would like to uh, encourage the the Indonesian government to 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 acknowledge uh, independence of West Papua in uh, in a dignified and in peaceful uh, uh, manner, and then we can live uh, as a good neighbor, and and then we yeah yeah do our 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 role together to protect our people and our territory. So 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 West Papua and Indonesia we are safe from the terrorist uh, organizations that they, they wanted to come to participate. Uh, so there's something that uh, yeah, I would like to highlight in this uh, webinar for those uh, government uh, hear my voice or our West Papua voice today. So please uh, uh, encourage or uh, yeah, talk to Indonesian government to let the West Papua people to have the country today. And we are, we are ready for that. Thank you, Di. Thank you, Belinda. Um, let, let's let's go to you now. I mean, uh, on the one hand, you know, we've heard that um, the Lombok Treaty doesn't necessarily stop West Papuans uh, and you know solidarity activists, you know, campaigning on West Papua, whether that's about self determination uh, or or other forms of human rights. But on the other hand, we've also kind of heard how it, it, it's vague and it's designed and it can constrain um, politicians. I mean, what, what's your, your views about this? Like, what, what do you see as the purpose of the Lombok Treaty? Does it really matter? Should we just say, well, you know, let's, it, let's not worry about it. Different governments have different views. We can just go on or, yeah, what's, what's your view? Uh my view of the Lombok Treaty is that it seems largely symbolic. It seems like a, <clears throat> a way of placating both sides. Um, and it's, but it also exists as this uncomfortable thing because it's not clear, it is vague, and there are plenty of gray areas. So whenever something comes up that one would think of referring back to the Lombok Treaty, it's kind of people don't want to talk about it. I mean, if if the Lombok Treaty was actually enforced in the way, like to the letter of the wording, in the way that, you know, it was interpreted by the Indonesian Foreign Office at the time it was created, then, you know, Veronica Komen, the human rights lawyer who the Indonesian police threatened to call Interpol on her, she's currently in Australia, um, Australia would have complied immediately and sent her over, according to the Lombok Treaty. I should say that um, last time I, I interviewed Veronica, she wasn't even certain that um, the Indonesian police had requested, officially requested Interpol, um, Interpol's help. But um, yeah, but there's there's plenty of examples of, of Papuan activism uh, in Australia, and I was interested to hear um, Adolf saying that, you know, it has hindered in some ways. I'd love to speak more about that. Um, but I guess my view of the, the treaty, you know, a, a, as an Australian citizen, as a journalist, as a researcher, as someone who's interested in freedom of expression, is that um, it's, it's strange to have a thing that um, means that in a democracy, uh, our politicians can't speak about, speak frankly about human rights issues. And it should, I guess, offend Indonesians as well, who also live in a democracy. Um, and there are interesting parallels here, I guess, I think around discussions in Indonesia, uh, you know, say the recent Balikpapan 7 case, where it was Amnesty International pointed out this case of seven Papuan men who were tried for treason for speaking out about racism. Amnesty International pointed out that Indonesia is a signatory to the UN Covenant of 
civil and political rights, which allows freedom of expression. So domestically, internally, these things should be allowed. Australia is also a signatory to that. And I, I think it's something that we don't think about. I was looking at the clause again today that, you know, it says both parties will not in any manner support or participate in activities that constitute a threat to their sovereignty. But the clause before that is, um, it must be consistent with their domestic and international obligations. Both countries have signed a covenant to say that they support freedom of expression. Frankly, there shouldn't be, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I would think that if we both, if both countries have a commitment to allowing freedom of expression in a democracy, it shouldn't be an issue to talk about um, things that are happening. And quite frankly, really awful human rights abuses have been reported um, for a long time, but, but recently. And yet um, you still see even, you know, left of center politicians like Penny Wong, the Labour Party's uh, foreign spokesperson, she condemned the the human rights abuses that occurred during the Papua uprising last year, but then inserted that almost automatic phrase of "but we respect the territory territorial integrity um, of Indonesia." And I was really taken by something that um, Papuan academic um, Elvira Rumkabu said. You know, she spoke about this is the problem that happens um, inside Indonesia where. Papua is always spoken about as a, as a binary. It's either, you know, you're a separatist or you absolutely support the territorial integrity of Indonesia. And there's no room for the nuances and, and the humanitarian issues that are occurring. And somehow Indonesia, uh, Australia has kind of fallen into this binary as well. Both countries need to think about their international obligations, I think. And the, if you really look at the wording of the Lombok Treaty, it seems to make room for that. So it's deliberate that it's such a gray area because you know it's the elephant in the room that um, particularly Australia, I think, doesn't want to talk about. I think um, for people that support freedom of expression, that support democratic norms, I think what we can do with the Lombok Treaty is keep talking about it and interrogating enough because it's the grey area that allows things to slip by the wayside. It's really interesting and if I recall correctly, Penny Wong actually referenced the Lombok Treaty in yeah, her statement yeah. about, yeah, yeah. yeah. Adolf, we're, we're going to move into questions and there's a couple of questions coming up on the chat now and I'd encourage you to, to, to put your questions there. We'll, we'll respond to questions about Lombok Treaty first before we pick up some of the, the bigger questions. Um, but Adolf, you know, do you want to say you know, a, a little bit more about your experience you know, uh, with, with the, in your interaction with politicians, um, have you heard them reference the Lombok Treaty? Um, and do you see it constraining uh, Australian politicians um, in terms of how they speak about West Papua? Like um, during the, uh, the th through for the um, Lombok Treaty, I love to see uh, more politicians to be more Australian, represent more Australian uh, democratics uh, system, not to be convinced by any other um, uh, nation to, to, to follow their own system. Um, I think it's very, very interesting that in Australian politicians, we has been adapted a lot to um, so many uh, neighboring um, nations that the politicians are not the Australian politicians, but they are literally has so many things in their mind. And will will be nice to see the Australian politicians being more fight for Australian and more democratic to uh, more active uh, supporting the uh, people um, struggle, especially around the Pacific nation. Um, look, in, in, in the past uh, 14 years since, since I, me and a group, we've been living in Australia, 
Um, we see there are a lot of interested uh, politicians that are looking uh, to express themselves on the day one and to continue support the um, democratic and struggle uh, among the West Papuan is still not there. Um, so far, learning from some of the party, uh, for example, let's say Richard Di Natale, he's really, his, his belief in democratic and during the Lombard Treaty, uh, there, there is no many uh, media who can travel across to, to West Papua and, and witnesses and um, um, evidence, take all the evidence what's happening in there reportedly. Um, there has, there has no uh, way for that, for them to go. And from Richard Di Natale that it's interesting. He's one of the um, uh, Australian politicians. So he wanna fight uh, through the media, uh, for example, bring, bring the journalists and media into this. Well, let's break the barrier of the Indonesia territory. Um, don't forget, when the 23 of West Papua came across with the boat as a protest, has created a big, big, massive challenge. And that's where we wanted to do the same things. Um, with the Lombok Treaty, that's stop us in, it's not stopping us in there. Um, that's where give us a lot of uh, strength to fight and working forward you know, toward, toward the um, democratic that we want. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of um, qualities, and we haven't seen anyone brave enough to say, "Look, I'm, I'm gonna say it's democratically, and then I'm gonna standing up for the people's right." And it's not there. Uh, for example, going back in West Papua, um, there are some um, non-West Papuan in in West Papua itself. We have a lot of people. Uh, in the highest uh, education, for example, in Indonesian um, cabinet ministry as well, do understand about the West Papua struggle. And they believe that would make a change if that would uh, cooperate and uh, could be resolved the um, situations uh, in West Papua. Because now we're heading toward the modern uh, lifestyle uh, in different era, the human rights, and the democratic supports to be uh, respected. And especially now we have seen equal right for the people um, engaged. It's, it's changing. And we're still sitting in the, in the 200th century again, being colonized and it's not there. And look, would be would be nice to see more pol uh, Australian politicians to be more um, demo uh, proactive and democratic democracy to 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 their own people, and for example, seeing the Indonesian representative has uh, came across all the way from Indonesia to Australia, meeting with uh, the meeting with the, our groups for um, when we first done touch down in, in Australia. Um, Indonesian president has bravely enough came across, represent the whole nation, want to meet the 43 of West Papua and we, don't, we, don't, we didn't accept that. And we put our statement to the, to the lawyer to say, look, you refused it. Um, a first person, number one person in Indonesia, we don't want to see him. And, Look, he's, he do understand that the problem is in, in West Papua. Um, he supposed to uh, talking to us before we came to Australia. And when we came to Australia, it's, it, it was big, big, massive journey that um, supported by the West Papuan. And if we turn around and talking to uh, Bambang Yudon Yono on the day, when he came across, for sure, uh, the whole West Papua will be turned around to us and say, you don't, you don't deliver the uh, protest, you don't deliver the uh, uh, message. And yeah, by seeing again with the Lombok Treaty, it's, it's a challenge us, but we, we're brave, we want against this. We want against. 
and it gave, gave us a lot of strength for it. Um, yeah, we truly believe one day uh, we will having the independence. But in saying that, uh, I'm talking in in my activist activist way, and and yeah, that I believe that um, we we supposed to be moved on. We supposed to be moved on, and that's not we we cannot stay in here. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Adolf. Thank you, brother. Um, let's. What we're going to do now, we're just going to have uh, a, a round responding to questions. We're, we're going to finish uh, by six thirty or, or close to, and I'd encourage you just to hang on. We've got something special uh, that we're going to end with. A bit of a bit of a Make West Papua Safe World premiere. Um, but before we get to that, we're going to do just a round of closing comments um, from the panelists. And I'll just read a couple of questions in case you want to touch on those in your, in your closing comments. So I've got a question from Jemina uh, here. If the Lombok Treaty was enforced to the letter of the wording, uh, if it was enforced in Australia, would that mean, what would that mean for flying the Morning Star flag in Australia and displaying other symbols of West Papuan independence um, and freedom of expression? What would that mean, you know, for Australian democracy? Uh, then there's a question from Margaret, uh, which is, you know, have parliamentarians explicitly said that they... Uh, that they won't talk about the root causes of the conflict because of the Lombok Treaty. Um, and there's uh, some comments, comment by Helen, two comments by Helen here saying that, you know, well, she's connecting it to what's happening in with uh, Indigenous rights, with the rights of Abor First Nations peoples here, Aboriginal uh, people and Torres Strait Islanders making the comment that Australian politicians can't be honest about freedom of speech and activity uh, in relation to Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, and also saying, making the point about, well, why do we have a country, an external country, dictating how Australia responds? And it seems that international trade and finance is more important than human rights. So there, there's, there's an, a range of other, other comments. I don't think we're going to get to them uh, all. There's uh, a comment for you, a question for you, Herman, uh, too, in, in terms of um, the, let me just go and find it here. Just bear with me. Um, Yes, how does the West Papua Human Rights Centre in Washington, D.C. interact with the United Liberation Movement for West Papua? And there's, there's questions, too, about uh, the relationship with Papua New Guinea as well. So, look, there's a lot there. I just invite you to, to make some closing comments before we have our little surprise. Um, and let's, let's go Herman, uh, Adolf and Belinda, and, and then we'll... Uh, we'll, we'll close with the, the surprise. Herman, uh, closing comments and responses to any, any questions. And you just need to unmute. Uh, thank you, Jason. Yeah. Mm, yeah. What Papua Human Rights Center and United Liberation Movement for West Papua. So, yeah, we are one coin. So uh, I play uh, my role as a, yeah, the founder of the West Papua Human Rights Center, but also I play my role as a United Liberation Movement for West Papua representative, United Nations. So, so just depend on uh, what the, the, that platform that, uh, I'm gonna to address the issue of uh, West Papua. Mm. So when we are talking about the uh, United uh, Liberation Movement for West Papua, yeah, we we are we are aware that uh, uh, we uh, gain a lot of uh, international support uh, uh, from the Pacific region, but also in the, the part of the continent uh, like the uh, Africa, uh, Caribbean, and Pacific. 
uh, but of course in the uh, United Nations uh, itself, uh, uh, the couple of countries uh, in UN member state country address the issue about the, the role of the United Liberation Movement for West Papua. So that's a part of the you know, my 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 uh, lobbying activity every day. Uh, but uh, I been living in in US uh, since uh, 2012. I come here as a, uh, uh, one of the visiting scholars at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at, at George Mason University. And after yeah few years and then we yeah, established the West Papua Human Rights Center because I do believe about the uh, human rights violation is still like uh, continue, uh, I mean, it's going on in West Papua and, and we learn from the, uh, the American uh, uh, situation. Many, many people here, they don't know about the issue. Uh, that's why we would like to establish the West Papua Human Rights Center as a one of the uh, legal platforms that's recognized by the US government. So can help us. To, to educate the American people to understand the, the, the issue in West Papua in, in terms of the uh, human rights violation, but also yeah, including the right of the self-determination. Because yeah, when we're talking about the, the principle and fundamental right uh, of, yeah, I mean, fundamental right to self-determination self of all the people, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a international uh, law, uh, and that's a UN charter. That's why something that uh, when we are we are pushed to the political direction. Uh, that's why I play my role as a, a, a United Liberation Movement for West Papua when I talk to the different uh, uh, diplomat, different uh, UN state member country in New York City when I uh, had meet with them. And that's something that when we're talking about lobbying, that's something that's uh, yeah, you know person to person. That's a that's a something that uh, it's not like uh, not in the public. So that's something like how we we challenge the government policy. How we we, we we challenge them to to see this is something that the current situation was proper. This is something that I play. So that's a um, I I can uh, describe that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's very important to understand the issue and then address the the the, the issue in, in in different way. So but yeah, I I I thank uh, my uh, American uh, friends here. Uh, so we do have a uh, West Papua Human Rights Center teams here. So it's not like, um, it's not just myself. So the first time I came to US, just, yeah, myself, just like people say, Herman, uh, you just, yeah, alone. But now I'm, I, I'm not alone. Now I have a team. I have a, a, the legal base here in US as a West Papua Human Rights Center, representative the West Papua people voice in here. And United States, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, here that's like our 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 campaign, our advocacy. When I talk to different different U.S. Congress members, address the issue. And the reason, uh, the the reason uh, our petition, uh, West Papua Human Rights Center petition to the, the U.S. government uh, through the uh, the White House uh, petition online, that uh, we address the the issue that uh, we ask the White House, U.S. government to 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 yeah. Uh, talk to the uh, Indonesian government or pressure Indonesian government to allow the the United Nations uh, uh, human rights investigation team to visit West Papua, including the uh, free uh, press, uh, international journalists to 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 allow to visit West Papua. So this something the uh, President Jokowi uh, promised uh, until today, but yeah, haven't haven't done uh, and yet. So that's why uh, we are we have to yeah uh, yeah play our role. So. To, to address the issue, whether in the human rights uh, platform or in the political direction. So that's, uh, yeah, we pray to God for giving our knowledge so we can yeah, talk in, in wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Di Herman. And, and look, perhaps if there wasn't the Lombok Treaty, you would see Australian politicians speaking more forthrightly about that UN visit to West Papua to investigate human rights, because as you say, Indonesia's agreed to it, but it still hasn't happened. Um, it's, you know, and it, and it needs, needs to. Uh, Adolf, uh, over to you. Uh, closing comments, response to any, any questions? Um, yeah, thank you. It's, a, it's a brilliant to see so many questions coming through. And Unfortunately, we don't have much time to share and answer all these questions. But look, um, we can still meet another times. And um, from my perspective of um, 
being activists, activists in, in Australia. And this is a big motivation and challenge that I'm standing up for all my people uh, right in this Papua battle. So um, during the Lombok Treaty, it has separated the ideology of uh, being West Papuan and being non West Papuan had separated us a lot. And um, my activist work, it challenged me it's to bring the ideology back between the connected of uh, much, uh, indigenous of West Papua and also the uh, non indigenous has growing a lot in West Papua that they, they still call. Uh, West Papua is their home, and that's where they were born and growing up there, and they call themselves uh, West Papuan. And this is that sort of democratic I see. I have to go there and, and yeah, start to um, what in, in simple, it, it just in, in proper way we say brainwash. So we, we lost, we lost, but also at the same time, we want to win these people uh, idea. And without uh, and then we're talking about the freedom and we're heading toward the freedom now. If we don't have enough voice and if we don't have enough um, ability to making uh, non-indigenous in West Papua understand, they won't support us. And that's, again, challenge when the uh, Dutch has and um, Indonesia led us to fought who want to integrate to Indonesia and who don't want to integrate. This is that challenge us, and that's another. That's that's my point. But also um, to encourage the non-indigenous who live in West Papua to support the West Papua struggle. That's our job as activists to to uh, bring this ideology to them. And also, I'm sure uh, I can't talk more about the um, uh, diplomatic things and stuff. But I'm sure uh, Herman is my leader, and he's got so many. Uh, knowledge to explain on the table as well and look this is just simple when we have the freedom um, how are we gonna um, uh, cooperate to um, save the non-indigenous people in West Papua that again by the way they've been living there for a long time and we support to protect them and this is gonna be massive massive challenge for us to do that and like being an ordinary activist, we don't get the paid job to do this, but we believe um, through your support, uh, by talking to you, uh, all our participants tonight, um, like, don't be hesitant, send your comment. And if you want to ask for an email address from us, do that through the webinar. And I'm sure Jason and some of the um, volunteer and the pan uh, panelists will, will uh, inform us and we should be able to answer your question as well. But I, I think it's just the times. I, I should stop so somebody else can, can say things as well. Um, I wish in the future we could have had more times. I'd like to share more for what's happening in there. And look, by living here in Australia for many, many years, and we did our activist protest and rally at the front of the Indonesian consulate and also the House representative in Canberra itself. Um, we've, we've been um, chasing, we've been uh, spied by the authority, opposite uh, authority, very much with Indonesian. And we all know that, yeah, Indonesia has no uh, regret to uh, paying a lot of money um, to stopping our struggle, but we, we, we never gonna stop. We, we, we are alive. We are alive. We wanna do that. <laughs> It's beautiful, man. We're never going to stop. We're never going to stop. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Uh, thank you, Adolf. Look, really pleased, you know, you and Herman can, can join us. We'll go to Belinda and then stay around and uh, there'll be a world premiere of something very, very special. Linda. Yeah, there's, uh, I, I think I've, without repeating myself, um, there were a couple of questions about, you know, it was in enforced to the letter of the law, what would it mean for being able to fly the Morning Star flag and have politicians expressly said um, that they can't speak? No, it's a gray area on both fronts. Um, politicians do talk about the territorial integrity of Indonesia whenever they talk about human rights. So you 
I think we can assume that that and, and they often cite the Lombok Treaty. So it's certainly a driving force in the way they talk about Indonesia and Papua. Um, and yeah, the, the treaty is is grey and unclear. And I think um, we should interrogate it further if we're interested in democracy and uh, and yeah, and sharing stories. So thank you so much to Herman and Adolf. I really enjoyed hearing yours. Yes, we're, we're very fortunate. And thank you to you too, uh, Belinda. So uh, we're going to now show a little animation. Um, goes for two minutes about the Lombok Treaty. And, um, and I'd want to encourage all of you, you know, as Belinda said, the Lombok Treaty is grey. You know, on the one hand, Indonesia would like it to mean that it stops anyone speaking about uh, West Papua's right to self-determination. And on the other hand, Australia saying, well, you know, we're a democratic country, just, you know, keep doing, you know, we've got democratic values. So let's push that gray area. And when you stand up and, and support West Papua, when you stand with West Papuans, you're effectively ripping up the Lombok Treaty. You're effectively taking that gag order off. So we're gonna I'm gonna play now uh, this short animation, rip up the Lombok Treaty. And that's what we hope you will join us to do. Here we go. Uh, In 2006, 43 West Papuans fled West Papua. They wanted to save their lives and their activism. Herman Wongai, the group's leader, built a traditional outrigger canoe. He gathered his friends and sailed it along the north coast, around the Bird's Head, all the way to Meraki, then across the Straits to Australia, where they landed near Weeper. Their arrival set off a political firestorm. First, the Indonesian government recalled their ambassador and they pressured the Australian government to sign a treaty on the island of Lombok in late 2006. The treaty says that both Australia and Indonesia will respect one another's territorial integrity. But we should ask, what does that actually mean? When it comes to our close neighbour, West Papua, Jakarta wants Australia to look the other way. We want you to be ignorant about the troubles over there. The Lombok Treaty stops the Australian government talking about the root problems in West Papua. The Lombok Treaty is the Indonesian government's gag order. Do we really want another government telling your political representative what they can and cannot do? We all have a choice. We either turn away from what is happening next door in West Papua or we rip up the Lombok Treaty. What will you do to make West Papua safe? So thank you everyone. Uh, and I'd like to actually thank the Australian government because uh, that little animation was made possible with an Australian government research council grant, which actually just shows how crazy the Lombok Treaty is. So look, please uh, join us, get in touch. If you wanna screen that animation, we'd love to see it screened on Indonesian consulates and Department of Foreign Affairs buildings. And um, remember, every time you stand with West Papua, every time you raise your voice and talk about the right to self-determination, talk about human rights happening in West Papua, you're effectively ripping up the Lombok Treaty. So that's what we wanna do. Here's the Lombok Treaty right here. You can see it there. We just wanna rip it up uh, and join, make West Papua safe, and stand with us, stand with West Papuans to rip up the Lombok Treaty. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Di Herman. Thank you, Adolf. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you all of you for joining us. Don't forget to uh, share the animation on social media, share the YouTube link, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks, Adolf. Thanks, Herman. Uh, thank you, Belinda and Jason and Adelo. Thank you, everyone, for yeah, organizing Thanks, it. Thank okay, Jason, uh, Kaka Herman, all the way from Washington. I'm sure you still stay up when it's your early morning over there. And thanks also, Belinda, for the, um, sharing the really good opinion. And Margie, thank you so much to work on the background and all the volunteers. And also, Poro, <laughs> I, can, I can hear yelling from background. Yeah, thanks for helping us. But look, I'm looking forward for the next session. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're going we're to finish up and look forward to seeing you in the real world, face to face and online. Go to All bed, right. Hammer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Herman. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you, Adolf. See you. Thanks, Maggie. Bye. Thanks, 